Hello again. Welcome to another Portland Community College Computer Information Systems 121 Introduction to Database Screencast. My name is Al Zimmerman. This is part four. In this screencast, we're going to cover database design. Specifically, we're going to look at the use of something called the schema, which is a succinct plan of all of the entities, and attributes, tables, and relationships in a database design. We're going to start with a review of the deliverables that come out of the analysis phase, the business rules, and the entity relationship diagrams. Then we're going to do an overview of the design process and talk about how we iteratively arrive at an efficient and effective design of database tables, attributes, and keys. We're going to talk a little bit about why it's important to remain independent of the particular database engine or database management system that you will be implementing your design on. First you design, then you build. It's important to keep those phases separate. Finally, we're going to work through a simple example and we're going to use a schema to convert an entity relationship diagram into a set of tables in our database design. Okay, let's get started. So if you've been following along on these screencasts, you know that we use a system development lifecycle technique, the analysis and design and build and deploy and support to design our database system. In the analysis phase, we described the customer's data clearly. We used business rules using simple language so that we could confirm with the customer that we were on the right track. Now, in the design phase, we're going to design the tables, the queries, the forms, and the reports that we need to implement a system that delivers the information that the customer wants that captures the data that they have and delivers the information that they want. So at the end of the design phase, what we're left with are a set of business rules that describe the data and entity relationship diagrams that allow us to have a visual representation of those business rules. As we said in previous screencast, this course is an overview of the process. So our business rules are very simple and they're focused on the data, its attributes, and the relationships among the entities. So the example we're going to use today is simple. We're gonna have people who own zero or many houses. Let me see if I can turn on my little laser pointer. A person owns zero or many houses. A house belongs to one or more people. Each person entity has a set of attributes. A house entity has a set of attributes. So we've gone through and we've done this analysis and we're going to now turn this into a table. Here's the process we're going to use to go from the analysis phase into a table design. We start with that entity relationship diagram. And we use a process of assigning entities to tables. Typically you start out by saying that each entity gets its own table. Then the attributes for that entity become the columns in that database table. We then look at that collection of tables and uh, attributes and say, is this the most efficient and effective way that we could represent this data, knowing what kind of information we are expected to retrieve from this database? Usually the initial answer is no. Um, it's an iterative process. So we start with our best estimates and then we start to change it to make it better. This process usually includes adding 
or deleting tables and moving entities and attributes between uh, tables to make the database better. Sometimes we create entities that the customer doesn't care about, but it makes it easier for us to manipulate and, and uh, retrieve information. Sometimes we find that the attributes need to be in a different table, or they need to be in their own table, and we just generate tables in order to store information efficiently. This is a process called normalization, which we'll cover in the future. Finally, we go back, we repeat, we check, are the, uh, the entities distributed to the right tables? Are the attributes in the right tables? And we evaluate, again, against a set of quality criteria. Do we have the most efficient, most effective database? Eventually, the answer to that question is yes. It's good enough for this iteration. And at that point, we start talking about, well, how do we implement this design in a particular database engine. We assign data types to the attributes and then we build the table using the database engine that we've chosen. Now why are we using a schema? We're using a schema so that we have a simple and efficient representation of these tables. As you'll see, a, a schema is actually a grid. It's like a spreadsheet where each of the columns lists a particular table and each of the rows lists the attributes. It can be a little confusing to think, well, am I dealing with a database table or am I dealing with a schema here? We'll sort that all out. Simply, however, we're going to uh, do this process step and this process step using a schema. And then in subsequent modules, we'll talk about how to actually build the database using uh, the next phase of the SDLC. Now, why do we want to stay independent of a particular database management system, of a particular database engine? Well, it's because they're all a little bit different. Most database engines, database management systems these days, all use some variation, some dialect of the structured query language. But they're all a little bit different. This is a table out of a Ruby on Rails textbook. Ruby on Rails is a web framework that tries to abstract away the differences between databases. And this is a way of illustrating just how different they can be. Now, if you want to store a decimal number, um, in some cases, they're all the same. They all store decimal numbers the same way. But it gets a little more complicated when you try to store something like time or dates. Sometimes the timestamps are stored as dates, sometimes there's times, sometimes there's date times. They have different data types for different databases. Similarly, if you're storing just binary data, each database engine is a slightly different situation and you have to be aware of those things. In summary, Every database engine has a little difference in the implementation details and has slightly different features, depending on which vendor you go for. Now, these features are all good things. Some things in some databases are just done better than in others. For example, if you have a huge database, the IBM DB2 and the Oracle database families are very powerful. If you have a constrained budget, but you still want quality, you can use an open source database like Postgres SQL. You choose the vendor because of what they bring to the market and because of these features. But until you have to make that decision, you want to keep your options open. And you want to make your design portable because you may find out that it's good to prototype in one kind of database that's cheap and easy to work with. And then when you actually deploy and have to handle millions of users, millions of transactions, then you're going to need to scale it up to a different vendor of database engines. And your design should be easily translated from one to the next. So that's why we use this abstract tool called a schema. So let's go for our first process step. We're going to take each entity and we're going to put it in the schema. And the way we represent a table is by taking this column. We, we name the table for the entity 
and then we create a primary key uh, for that particular table. Now you can derive a primary key from the client data, you know, some combination of name and, and phone number and zip code or something like that can uniquely identify a person, for example. It's better to have your database engine automatically generate a primary key. That way that you know that the primary key is unique for each record and that there is what's called primary key integrity. We'll cover that more next week. Every table gets a primary key. Then you go to the next step and you take the attributes from the entities and you put them in the schema as well. You do this for all of the entities and then you implement the relationships among entities using what's called foreign keys. Foreign keys are just the primary keys from another table. We'll cover this in a minute. In fact, let's use a simple example. So we're going to start, like our process says, with the entity relationship diagram. And it's our old friend, the person owns a house and the house belongs to a person. In this example, we're going to simplify it just a little bit. We're going to say that a house belongs to one person. This is what's called a one-to-many relationship. One person, many houses. And the reason we're going to use this simple example is because it's simple. It's easy to show the essential idea of foreign keys and primary keys with a one-to-many relationship. A lot of relationships are more complicated than that. Boy, this sounds like an advice show, doesn't it? A lot of relationships are complicated. The very common relationship is called many-to-many. -many. But in this first look at foreign keys and primary keys, we'll implement a one-to-many relationship. So let's take that uh, entity relationship diagram let's plug it into a schema. We take our first entity, the person, and its various attributes, and we say, well, let's have a person table. And any table is going to have a primary key, and we're going to generate that primary key ourselves. We're going to name it for the table, and we're just going to put the word ID on it. Now, you'll notice in the materials for the class that there are a lot of different naming conventions for tables. Sometimes you see the tables are all uppercase. Sometimes you see someone put a PK at the end of the primary key name. Follow the naming convention that your particular design team is using. In the homework, you can see that there's a, there's a design uh, criteria for naming conventions. I don't remember what it is right now. The important thing is that the primary key name is derived from the table name, so you always know what you're looking at. And again, I tend to use just the acronym ID for, this is an ID for the person. Then we go to the next step and we take all of the attributes from the entity and we put them in the schema as well. And what we're left with is a column in this schema spreadsheet grid that represents that table. The name of the table, the primary key, and then all of the attributes. At this stage we don't care if the first name is a text string or if the credit rating is a floating point number or if it's just a big integer. We just know that we need to track these things to do a good job for our customers. Then we go through the system and we do this again for all the entities. So in our simple little ERD, we have a, a house entity. We create another entry in the schema that says we're going to make a house table. The primary key is going to be called house ID and the various attributes are the, uh, the address of the house, the floor area, how many square feet it is, um, how many bedrooms it has, how many bathrooms. Now you can see here that something called address as an attribute 
There's a lot more to addresses than just one attribute in a table. There's towns, there's cities, there's zip codes, there's all sorts of information that goes into an address. If you're in a realtor database, you've got lot numbers and subdivisions and all sorts of things. Later on in the design process, we may take that address attribute and move it to its own table. Right now, we're going to deal with it just as a simple atomic attribute and leave it at that. Because we're not quite done representing all the entities, attributes, and relationships in our ERD. So now we have to look at the relationship. Remember, one person can own zero or many houses. A house belongs to one person. How do we implement that? Well, in our schema, we see that every table has a primary key. So we're going to represent the person who owns this house as just an ID in the house record. Each house has a foreign key that contains the primary key of the person who owns the house. In schemas, we store the primary keys up at the top in the top row, and then we store the foreign keys down at the bottom. So let's take, we want to know which person owns this house. So we're going to take the person ID, and we're going to put it in the house table as a foreign key. So now, if I want to know anything about a house, I can go to the house table and I can look up its address, its floor area, its bedrooms. And if I want to know if someone owns this, what is more information about that person, I take this person ID and I look up the person in the person table. That way I can get their name and their credit rating, all the details I need out of them. I don't need to store all that information in the house table. I store it in the person table. And then for their second house, I put another entry in the house table, and I use the same ID. It's very efficient, and the database engines are optimized to make this very fast and very efficient. So this is the way that you implement a relationship in a database table set. And this is how you represent it in a schema. You put the primary key of one table into the foreign key of another table. Now here's a hint, because you're going to be looking at primary keys and foreign keys in your homework. Look for the rules that say belongs to. A house belongs to one person. That might indicate that you've got a one-to-many relationship, and that might mean that the house table, in this case, is the place where you want to put your foreign key. So let's summarize. We're using a design process, and the flowchart looks like this. In this screencast, we focused on two particular uh, process steps where we used a schema to assign entities to a table and to assign attributes to a table. Next week, we'll look further into how do we optimize, how do we iterate on this design so that the database table set gets to be as efficient and effective as possible. Summarize the vocabulary we've been using up to now. A schema is a plan for a set of database tables. It has an entry for each table and all of the attributes that are stored in that table plus the primary keys and the foreign keys that are used to connect these tables together. We used entities and attributes. Those terms are review from the last time. An entity is just anything in the customer's world that needs to be stored and needs to. we need to find out information about. Attributes are the key characteristics of these entities. Then we introduced the terms primary key, which is an identifier which is unique for each record in a table. And then we introduce the term foreign key, which is just the primary key from another table that allows you to connect tables and to follow relationships through your database and to gather more information. 
So that's it for me for this screencast. Thank you very much for uh, your attention, and I'll see you next time.